Hello there, my friends, and welcome back to another dose of your weekly Battle Max of Battletech. Today's video is gonna be once again the winner of last week's poll. And according to your votes, the winner was none other than the Wolfhound, so it is gonna be today's star. Do stay until the end of the video and vote for the next topic too. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? A few stats on the guy include... It does belong in the light category, although on the upper side with 35 tons. It has a top speed of 97 km an hour, and a rounded price of 3.1 million seabells. The Wolfhound is a light, rugged, and dependable design, and it has first made an appearance in 3028. Following the success of the Hatchetman, which was designed in partnership with the Federated Sons, Archon Katrina Steiner ordered Farhez Industries to produce another specific battle mech. The goal of this one was to address a persistent problem of the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces, which was hunting down and destroying the Panther and the Jenner. These were mechs of the Draconis Combine which had embarrassed the LCAF one too many times. So, the final design would end up being a light battle mech with an all-energy weapon payload effective at a wide variety of ranges, the maximum amount of armor for a mech of its class, and the use of standard components to keep the cost down. Due to their fierce loyalty to House Steiner, the Kelhounds mercenary unit were the first ones chosen to field test the Wolfhound in battle, followed shortly afterwards by Wolf's Dragoons. The design received its baptism of fire in the Fourth Succession War, where it did exceed expectations and perform brilliantly. This was especially true when the Wolfhound faced its intended target, hitting the Jenners beyond their ability to return fire while closing the distance on the Panther. With the successful end of the war, the Federated Commonwealth ordered a large number of Wolfhounds to outfit their military, and the design was used again in the War of 3039. By the War of 3039, the Wolfhounds were spread between the two houses' militaries, and their loyal mercenary units as well. They were also very lucky, as they suffered far fewer casualties than many other designs during that conflict, and only a handful fell into the hands of the Combine. While they were impressed with the mech, the Kuritans were too prideful to copy it themselves, instead using captured examples of it to help develop the so-called Wolf Trap, to specifically counter this very mech. Eventually, Arc Royal Mechworks was brought in to produce Wolfhounds under license from Farhas, and the recovery of Lost Tech thanks to the Helm Memory Core did allow for a more advanced variant to be made to combat the clans. Unfortunately, the necessary retooling of the factories to produce the WLF-2 model, introduced in 3052, took far too long before Comstar brought an end to the invasion at the Battle of Tukai. The newer Wolfhounds did continue to be made for both FEDCOM member states, although following the formal creation of the Lyran Alliance, the Farhes factories began producing the newer WLF-3S model. This one was only shipped to the loyal units of the Lyran state, and thus fought on the side of Catherine Steiner Davion during the FEDCOM Civil War. During the Jihad, the Word of Blake launched a devastating attack on Farkad, effectively shutting down the factories of the Wolfhound. In response, Ark Royal increased production and introduced the WLF-4 model, to replace the losses suffered by Allied forces against the Blakeists. As a so-called laser boat, the Wolfhound's very basic weapons array frees it from any supply lines and also allows for superior endurance during an extended campaign. The main gun is a Cyclops 12 ER Lodge laser mounted in the right arm, which allows the Wolfhound to strike targets up to 600 meters away. As secondary weapons for closer combat, the Wolfhound is armed with four Defiance medium lasers. Three of these are split between the right, center, and left torso, while the fourth is mounted in the center rear, in case any other mech tries to exploit this traditional blind spot. Ten double heat sinks allow for superior heat management, while seven and a half tons of armor provide excellent protection for such a light mech. 
While the majority of the components used in the Wolfhound are of Lyran origin, the use of a full head ejection system did require the help of the Federated Sons. Many mech warrior lives have been saved thanks to this very system's ability to operate in traditionally hostile environments. A few variants of this wolfy mech include. Of course, not all the pictures represent the actual variants. The WLF-1 This one is the original Wolfhound model, produced from 3028 until the introduction of the WLF-2 variant. The pre-hell memory core WLF-1's main weapon is a standard Setanta Lodge laser, making its striking distance shorter than that of the later models. While the 10 standard heatsinks do not dissipate as much heat as the subsequent models. The WLF-1A This was just a common refit employed by some mech warriors, removing the rear-mounted medium laser and adding one extra heatsink instead. The WLF-1B This one only repositions the rear-firing medium laser to face forward as well. The WLF-2H model This is the production model of the WLF-2X variant, which we're gonna get to in a moment. It was introduced in 3082. To ease production, the actuator enhancement system has been removed, and replaced by one extra heatsink. The reflective armor has been replaced by the standard armor available anywhere in the inner sphere. Its heavy PPC retains the PPC capacitor, and the XL engine retains the supercharger, which in turn allows for impressive speed boosts. A pair of ER medium lasers and one ER small laser round up the weaponry. The WLF-2X This one was developed by Arc Royal Mechworks in the middle of the Jihad. It is an extensively modified variant utilizing experimental technology. It has an endosteel chassis and an extra light engine to save weight. Its main weapon is a right arm mounted heavy PPC, enhanced by both a PPC capacitor and an actuator enhancement system. The torso mounted weapons remain only lasers, specifically two ER medium lasers and a single ER small laser, while 10 double heatsinks allows it to keep the heat level low. An enhanced defensive protection comes in the shape of a supercharger enhanced speed and cosmetically styled laser reflective armor. The WLF-3S This one was introduced in 3064, and it sacrifices a bit of its durability for increase in firepower. It is powered by a light fusion engine which does free up enough space on the chassis for some new equipment. The ER Lodge laser was removed and replaced by an ER PPC, extending its range even more. The medium lasers are replaced by three forward-facing ER medium lasers and a rear-facing ER small laser. And finally, the chassis is now built using endo steel, and the mech has two extra double heatsinks to help it handle the much heavier heat burden. The WLF-3M this one is a post-Jihad refit of the 3S in use among the states of the former Free Worlds League. It removes two double heatsinks and one half ton of armor, and replaces the ERPPC and the ER lasers with a right arm mounted light Gauss rifle and one ton of ammo. The WLF-4W This one is based on the older WLF-2 model, and is intended as a mid-range harasser. It was introduced in 3069 by Arc Royal Mechworks, and it has an endosteel chassis carrying three light PPCs in the torso, as well as an ER medium laser and an ER small laser in the right arm. And finally, the WLF-5. This one is a post-Jihad variant produced on Arc Royal alongside the 4W variant in 3079. It is built on an endosteel frame, powered by a large 245-rated XL engine, increasing its speed by 20 km an hour, making it capable of almost 150 km an hour in short bursts due to the inclusion of a mask system. It replaces the armament of lasers with an array of PPCs, a right-arm-mounted snub-nose PPC, 
supported by a pair of torso-mounted light PPCs. A couple of famous mech warriors known for using the Wolfhound include Major Daniel Allard. This guy is a member of the Kel Hounds mercenary unit and was the first to be given a prototype Wolfhound to test pilot while still a captain after the destruction of his Valkyrie in 3027. He would later go on to use the machine to fight in many famous battles before being promoted to operational commander of the unit. Force Commander Melissa Beret Despite the heavy fighting of the War of 3039, the single wolfhound employed by a non-federated commonwealth unit, until the clan invasion anyway, was not under a combined banner, but rather in the Free Worlds League. Despite suffering heavy losses on Marcus at the hands of the Third Crucis Lancers, the 25th Merrick Militia did have a single success during the campaign a diversionary raid by the then Captain Beret. Her lance drew up several companies of Lancer Light battle mechs in an attempt to ease the pressure on her regiment by engaging in a hit-and-run battle, striking supply depots behind the Lancer's lines. When the 25th dropships finally arrived, Beret's lance made its way back to the rendezvous, dragging one wolfhound with a breech cockpit along with them. Then promoted to fill the holes made by the many casualties, Force Commander Beret now pilots that very mech, nicknamed Small Favors, as a morale booster for the devastated unit. Now, for today's poll, since we already had an example from the light, medium and heavy categories, is gonna be a selection of assault mechs. So, the choices I cooked up are Option A, the awesome Option B, the Corsair, and Option C, the Crockett. To vote, simply write down the option you like most in the comments below. Thank you very much for participating. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Wolfhound Light Battle Mech for today. Definitely, at least in my opinion, one of the most cost-effective light mechs ever made at least when it comes to sustainability during a campaign. But what are your thoughts on this wolfy mech? Did you use it or encounter it before? Do share your thoughts and experiences, if you want, in the comments below as always. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Do click the bell icon as well to stay more up to date. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all a great and healthy day. This is GDN signing out.